Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Antibiotic Use in the Time of COVID, presented by Kate Zintars. My name is Brian Carey, Vice President of Marketing here at Unbound Medicine. The webinar will be about 15 to 20 minutes in length. While the presentation is pre recorded, please feel free to submit questions in the area provided, and answers will be provided via email. At the conclusion of this webinar, we will send a link to everyone in just a couple days so you can share it with colleagues. Now, please let me introduce our presenter. Dr. Zintar has obtained her Doctor of Pharmacy from the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy. She is currently a clinical pharmacy specialist in infectious diseases and antimicrobial stewardship at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Zintars is chair of the Infectious Diseases Society Council for the Board of Pharmaceutical Specialties and is the past chair of the Antibiotic Subcommittee for the Maryland Society of Health System Pharmacists. Her current professional interests include antimicrobial stewardship, antifungal therapy, and gram-negative resistance. At this time, I'll turn it over to you. Kate? Thank you, Brian. Thanks everyone for joining today, and thank you to Unbound Medicine for the opportunity to uh, discuss some of these issues related to COVID disease with everyone. The title of today's presentation is Antibiotic Use, or We Might Find Abuse in the Time of COVID-19. Today, I hope to evaluate the available data on the rate of bacterial co-infection and secondary infection in patients who present with COVID-19, to discuss antibiotic use, or as we may see, overuse, in patients presenting with COVID-19 disease, and identify and complement antimicrobial stewardship programs during this global pandemic. It's September of 2020, and for the most part, it's still difficult to believe that we're operating in the midst of a global pandemic. Such as it is, though, this is certainly our new reality. In December of 2019, an outbreak of pneumonia of unknown cause was identified in Wuhan, a city in the Hubei province of China. Things progressed rather quickly from here with documented human-to-human -human transmission, and SARS-CoV-2 was identified as the etiologic agent in early January of this year. Two weeks later, the first case was identified in the United States, and just 10 days after that, the World Health Organization declared a global health emergency. Several waves and epicenters have since emerged over the first half of this year, and by the end of July, there have been more than 18 million infections recorded and nearly 700,000 deaths due to COVID-19. Despite so much that still remains unknown about this silent enemy, antimicrobial stewardship practices will most certainly be affected. Antimicrobial stewardship is defined as a series of coordinated interventions used to improve antimicrobial use by ensuring that patients receive the correct agent at the correct dose for the correct duration. One question that remains to be answered is the incidence of bacterial co-infection or the suggestion that bacterial infection is present at the time of COVID diagnosis. Here we would think about community acquired pneumonia. Fever, cough, and chest x-ray changes are associated with both disease states. Alternatively, the incidence of secondary infections or bacterial infections that result as a consequence of viral disease also remain unknown. Examples here would include infection associated with prolonged hospital courses, such as healthcare-associated pneumonia or ventilator-associated pneumonia, or the development of, of <clears throat> excuse me, the development of catheter-associated bloodstream infections. This is a prime setup for widespread and excessive antibiotic use, given the anxiety and uncertainty associated with a global pandemic as well as the lack of antiviral therapy with proven effectiveness against COVID-19. One might ask if history can teach us a lesson. While it is estimated that up to 15 million people succumbed to influenza in the 1918 pandemic, the major contributors associated with mortality were heightened immunologic factors and secondary bacterial infections. Approximately one in four individuals had bacterial co-infection with pneumococcus and staphylococcus aureus being the most likely to be recovered from sputum cultures. A few caveats exist here, though. The role of difficult-to-detect organisms, or the atypicals, including mycoplasma, 
remains unknown. Additionally, this data is largely comprised of hospitalized patients only. The incidence of bacterial co-infection in the community is not well documented. It has been documented, however, that influenza patients admitted to the hospital are more likely to receive antibiotics rather than antivirals, even with confirmation of viral illness. Perhaps the risk is same with all coronaviruses. Looking back earlier in this century, it has been documented that the incidence of co-infection with both SARS and MERS were negligible. In one of the first meta-analyses published by Rossin and colleagues, they included 18 studies that were published from January 2000 through April of this year to identify the incidence of co-infection among all recent coronaviruses, including SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. Half of the papers included in this meta-analysis were associated with COVID-19 disease. The primary aim of this study was to identify the reported incidence of co-infection. Co-infection in this data set included any incidence of infection and not necessarily co-infection at the time of presentation compared to secondary infections. Secondary data extraction, when available, included antibiotic prescribing data, microbiology samples recovered, and reported complications from antimicrobial therapy. Of the 800 patients that were diagnosed with COVID-19, only 62 or 8% of patients actually reported a bacterial co-infection. Of the more than 2,000 COVID patients who received antimicrobial therapy though, 72% were prescribed and received antibiotics. Unfortunately, no stu antimicrobial stewardship interventions were documented. There is quite a discrepancy between the number of patients with bacterial infection and those who receive antibiotics for the treatment of a suspected infection. Data from a prospective observational study over a roughly two month period from the Parkland Health and Hospital System sought to determine the true incidence of bacterial co-infection at the time of COVID-19 diagnosis. Patients were included if they tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, were at least 18 years of age and admitted to the hospital, but they were excluded if their index admission was at an outside facility. Once they met this criteria, they were further evaluated to assess if antibiotics were administered within the first 48 hours of admission. If they were, additional data was obtained. If not, they were not included in the data set. A total of 147 patients were ultimately enrolled in the study. Outcomes selected were to characterize factors driving antimicrobial prescribing in patients presenting with COVID-19 as well as to assess the incidence of community-acquired bacterial, respiratory, or non-respiratory infections. Just about 60% of the patients included in this cohort were initiated on antibiotics within 48 hours of admission. Based on indication, community-acquired pneumonia was the most common co-infection suspected, and 87% of patients received a minimum of two antibiotics. Being that the leading indication was CAP, ceftriaxone and azithromycin were the most commonly utilized antibiotics. And perhaps fortunately, broad spectrum therapy, which was namely beta-lactams with enhanced gram-negative coverage, were only given to 16% of subjects. Despite the high suspicion for community-acquired respiratory tract infections, only 32% of patients had cultures obtained. No cultures were positive for any significant growth, all antigen tests returned negative, and there were no cases of community-acquired bacterial respiratory tract infections that were diagnosed. The incidence of co-infection in this cohort was negligible, but the use of antibiotics excessive. Of note, the authors did comment that once testing was done in-house with rapid turnaround, they were successful in de-escalating or stopping therapy much more quickly. A group from Canada performed a rapid systematic review to detect the incidence of both bacterial co-infection or infection at the time of COVID-19 presentation and secondary infection or infections that are developing later in the disease course and or with hospital stay. So Langford and colleagues included human studies with patients with laboratory confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection. Patients were from all age groups and all healthcare settings and studies were excluded if they did not report any data on concurrent bacterial infections. The main outcome was to assess 
<clears throat> was to assess the overall proportion of confirmed acute bacterial infection stratified by either co-infection or secondary infection. These rates were further stratified by illness severity, mainly decided by the patient location, either hospitalized on the general wards or those deemed critically ill who often resided in an ICU. A total of 28 studies met criteria and were included in the final review. Of the nearly 3,500 patients that were included from all studies, 296 were evaluated for the presence of a bacterial co-infection. The authors determined that the overall incidence of bacterial infection was quite low at just 7.1%. When separating this out, however, the incidence of co-infection at the time of COVID diagnosis was only 3.5%, suggesting that concomitant bacterial illness at the time of presentation does not often occur. Conversely, at least 15% of patients went on to develop a secondary bacterial infection during the course of their hospitalization. When stratifying this by patient location, the overall incidence of bacterial infection in all hospital patients was just under 6%, and that incidence increased in patients who were critically ill or ultimately succumbed to COVID-19 disease. This suggests that secondary bacterial infections contribute to the overall mortality associated with disease. Interestingly, once again, concurrent antibiotic use was quite high, with more than 70% of patients receiving antimicrobial therapy. In this cohort, however, we saw increased use of broad-spectrum antimicrobials with fluoroquinolones and carbapenems making up 60% of all antibiotics that were used. While both the way and the Langford data confirmed that the incidence of bacterial infection was quite low, Nori and colleagues described their experience over a seven week period at the Montefiore Medical Center in New York City at the height of their surge. This was a retrospective observational report that included all patients with a positive SARS-CoV-2 PCR and a positive bacterial culture from either the respiratory tract or the bloodstream. Patients were excluded in the event that blood cultures were thought to be a contaminant, respiratory cultures with yeast, normal flora, or mixed species, as well as all urine cultures that did not have concurrent bacteremia. All data was obtained from the microbiology lab, and all cases were reviewed by an ID specialist to determine both the presence of co-infection and confirm the source. The main purpose of this study was to assess the incidence of bacterial and or fungal infection and determine the emergence of antimicrobial resistance in COVID-19 patients. 152 distinct patients were included from a pool of more than 4,200 COVID positive patients, giving an overall infection rate of just 3.6%. 91 patients had positive respiratory cultures, 82 had positive blood cultures, with 21 patients having both positive respiratory and blood cultures. The data in the graph presented here describes the microbiology of these infections. The dark blue bars are respiratory infections, the light green bars bloodstream infections, and the gray bars indicate the presence of a multidrug resistant organism. Staphylococcus aureus was the most common bug recovered from either type of culture, followed by various gram-negative bacteria. The overall incidence of multidrug resistance was really quite low, but it should be noted that nearly 80% of patients included in this study had antibiotic exposure in the preceding 30 days. While this data is limited in being a small observational study, it does once again suggest that the incidence of co-infection is really quite low and antibiotic use is quite high. So this brings us to the treatment recommendations set forth from both the National Institutes of Health and the World Health Organization. Both groups suggest reserving empiric antibiotic use for those with severe disease and the criteria for severe illness or severe disease from each respective institution is provided here for you. With daily assessment of culture data and rapid de-escalation or cessation of therapy once culture results and other diagnostic tests return. So significant concern remains that antimicrobial stewardship practices might be abandoned during this time, but I would argue that these activities can be repurposed, and they should be. Several groups have come forward with proposed recommendations for how this might happen. 
Two of the guiding mechanisms for ASP practices are prospective audit with intervention and feedback and formulary restriction with or without pre-authorization. For those practicing prospective audits, ensure that your providers are compliant with current institutional guidelines for the management of COVID-19 disease. Formulary, instruction, formulary restriction ideas would include balancing the expansion versus the relaxation of the number of restricted agents for both the treatment of COVID and resultant bacterial infections, monitoring for drug shortages and not necessarily just antimicrobial drug shortages will be crucial for success. As always, it is important to streamline or de-escalate antibiotics once diagnostics and culture results are known. Other opportunities to continue stewardship practices will be to maintain education. Stewardship teams have the opportunity to provide a key role in disseminating information to other frontline providers as it becomes available. This also works well and in concert with the third bullet point here. Partner with both your microbiology lab and infection prevention programs to provide information on new tests as they become available. Finally, making the change from IV to PO therapy can assist with possibly shortening length of stays and preventing a, the <clears throat> incidence of additional hospital acquired infections. Always remember that shorter is better. This is becoming one of the new stewardship mantras. There is clinical data endorsed by national guidelines to support five to seven days of therapy for both community acquired as well as both hospital and ventilator associated pneumonias. Other indications and treatment durations are provided here for your future reference. Finally, there are many research needs that still need to be assessed. While we have a good grasp that the overall incidence of bacterial co infection is low, and antibiotic use is high, we still need to establish the exact incidence of bacterial co-infection as well as secondary infections during the course of COVID-19 disease. There is a need to identify the role of biomarkers as diagnostics to rule in or rule out bacterial infection. <clears throat> the use of procalcitonin remains a hot topic in this area. And there's also a need to identify the contributions of infection versus the immune response during the curse during the course of COVID-19. Finally, we need to assess the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the global antibiotic use and resistance development among various healthcare settings. So just to summarize some of the important points that we talked about today, the incidence of bacterial co-infection with COVID-19 presentation is exceedingly low. The data presented here suggests that this incidence is less than 5%. We should consider antibiotic therapy in those presenting with severe disease with rapid de-escalation or cessation of therapy once diagnostics and or culture results are available. The true incidence of secondary infection and its impact on antimicrobial resistance still remains largely unknown at this time. But what is of most importance is to note that now is not the time to abandon stewardship practices and much is still needed in the way of research to help guide stewardship on a daily basis. I thank everybody for their time and I will turn it back over to you, Brian. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Zintars. And I wanna thank everyone for attending today. If you are interested in learning more about the Johns Hopkins Antibiotic Guide or Unbound's local antimicrobial stewardship solution, please be sure to contact us at webinars at unboundmedicine.com. Again, thank you for attending and I hope everyone has a wonderful day.